In the line of duty, they swear to protect, to serve, and to uphold the law. But what happens when the protector becomes the predator? This is the chilling saga of Rosemary Nolovu, a former South African police officer turned cold-blooded serial killer. Armed with a badge and a nefarious network, she orchestrated a series of murders so sinister they unravel the very fabric of trust that we place in those meant to keep us safe. From the shadows of authority, she spun a web of greed and deceit, casting herself as the beneficiary of her own orchestrated tragedies. Join me today as we dive into the dark chronicles of a cop who traded her oath for blood money. Most of you might be familiar with South African cities like Cape Town, been there, Bloemfontein, Pretoria, and Johannesburg. But it's less likely that you've heard of places like Kyalitsha, Manguong, Tembisa, Marmadlodi, Alexandria, and Soatu. These townships started out as shanty towns, but they now form an integral part of the cities they're located in. I feel like I've heard of Soweto for, or Soweto for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe it came up in a video at some point that I've done previously. But anyway, there are various reasons for why these places exist. Historically, South Africans of all races flocked to the Witwatersrands after gold was discovered there in 1886, and they all made their homes in the fledgling city that would later become known as Johannesburg. In 1923, the Urban Areas Act was passed, and it declared that towns and cities had to be segregated according to race for the sake of sanitation. This was 25 years before the apartheid laws were implemented. Yeah, it's like South Africa. I don't imagine it was like, you know, apartheid, obviously super racist, but it's Look, I don't know much about South African history, but I'm going to assume that before apartheid, it was also super racist, just like less, like everywhere else in the 1920s. Although maybe more because it is South Africa, <laughs> a little bit famous for it. And uh, I'm just going to assume that before it was also super racist. Then it was just codified, I'm guessing. You're a football player. It's in your blood. That's racist. Your soul. That's racist. Your eyes. That's gay. That's homophobic. That's black. That's racist. Damn. As a result, almost every town in South Africa was declared a white zony area, and on the outskirts of the established towns and cities, separate townships were created for the various races. Coloureds, or people descended from Malaysian slaves who were brought here by the Dutch in the 17th century, the descendants of Indian slaves who were brought here by the British in the 18th and 19th centuries, and black South Africans who left their villages hoping for better opportunities in the cities. These days, people from all races are allowed to live wherever they like, but some still prefer to keep to their townships, preferring the communities that they'd created there. But for others, the townships, and especially the black townships, are poverty-stricken hellholes that they can't escape. Our black cultures share a lot of similarities with other native cultures all over the world. Uh, by referring R, obviously I'm not South African, I'm uh, British, although my, uh, my grandma was. She lived in Johannesburg, she recently died rip um but yeah she lived in johannesburg but uh emma who wrote today's episode is there so uh, is from south africa or lives in south africa i'm assuming is from there i'm not sure <laughs> but um that's why r that's why how that works our black cultures share a lot of similarities with other native cultures all over the world their communities are mostly spearheaded by a chief although some still have reigning kings and queens really the tribal authority helps to govern these communities and members of the community are encouraged to practice ubuntu which involves respecting others helping out where needed sharing what you have caring for those around you and generally just being a good human being see for me i thought ubuntu was a, a form of linux like uh that, that, that operating system for nerds that I've, I've used in the past. <laughs> I did use Ubuntu. Ubuntu? Ubuntu? Nerd! Matters of spirituality and health are handled by a Sangoma, or a spiritual slash traditional healer, aka a shaman, and they also act as advisors to the chief and members of the community, and they're responsible for communicating with the ancestors and often lead ceremonial rituals. Weddings and funerals are particularly big events in the black community, and it's common practice for the entire community to attend these events and the various cultural and spiritual rituals that take place. Gogo Dineo, a spiritual leader, explained in Showmax's documentary Rosemary's Hit List that, quote, When there is a funeral, when there is a wedding, the community comes together and we contribute different things towards that ceremony. Because irrespective of the family's circumstances, one hand washes the other. Oh, I should just mention that Emma left me a note at the beginning, which I didn't read, but I'll read it now because I was like, 
I'll manage. And now I read the notes. Please note, this episode is filled, all caps, with African names. So, Mzanzi, forgive our fact boy, okay? He's doing his best. I am doing my best, and I appreciate all of the phonetic spellings, Emma, because otherwise it would be a nightmare, because I tried looking up a couple of these in, like, my favorite pronunciation dictionary, and shockingly, not there. Funerals are also an event that is attended by the entire community. Various morning rituals have to be performed. A wake is held that can last for up to a week and consists of various cleansing rituals, and usually the family is expected to feed the mourners and pay for the funeral, which becomes quite costly if 200 people show up to mourn the deceased. As Linnea explains, quote, When the person passes on, we're actually obligated to all give a bit of a contribution in most families that whoever has with whatever that they have you don't always have to contribute financially but others contribute by being the ones who organize certain elements of the burial others will be the ones who are always making tea for the people or who are coming to mourn with us others will be responsible for the chopping of the vegetables or for the shopping according to the book killer cop the rosemary and lovo story by journalist naledi shange funerals can cost between six thousand and fifty thousand rand it all depends on how extravagant you want to be and in South Africa, it is... Hey Siri, how much is 50,000 South African rand in American dollars? I don't understand this. You know, neither do I sometimes. Yeah. <clears throat> neither do I. $2,600. That's a lot of dollars. But like, I'm sure like in America, funerals cost that much. But this is South Africa. It doesn't have that American money. And in South Africa, it has become a common practice for black families to include multiple members of their extended family in their funeral policies since they're so inexpensive, with prices starting at just 45 rand per person. That's the equivalent of 1.7 liters of petrol or two loaves of bread. Furthermore, all you need to do to sign up for a funeral policy is to call the insurer and provide them uh, with your personal information, unlike life policies that require several health checks to ensure that a person is eligible to apply for life cover. Yes, yeah, I remember I had a... I don't have a life insurance policy because it's a complete nightmare here. Like, we have a, a sponsor. It'd be amazing if they actually sponsored this video called Policy Genius. And they make getting life insurance. This isn't paid. But it's just like, I looked into this as well. I'm like, oh my God, it's so easy, Americans. Here is a total nightmare. It's so expensive for crap cover. And Policy Genius, it's like, I swear, it's like $30 a month. I, I put my details in just to be like, let's see what I could get. I obviously can't because I'm not American. And it was like, wait, that much coverage for this little money? I was like, that's amazing. But I did have one, uh, not a life insurance policy, but when I, I, bought a, I bought an apartment and I took a mortgage on it and they were like, the bank was like, well, we need to have insurance on this in case you like pop your clogs or something. And I'm like, right, I'm like 20 something years old. What are you? <laughs> yeah, but they're like, yeah, but when you finally pay this off, you'll be like 60, won't you? <laughs> or later, I'll be like, oh yeah, fair, good point. And so, but I had to go for a medical and they're testing me and make sure that I'm not going to die and stuff. And I have to say, I was quite like, oh, that's nice. That they're confident that I'm not going to die anytime soon, which was good. And they were like, yeah, they, there was a questionnaire asking me all these questions like what drugs I take, legal and illegal, and like whether I drink and smoke and all of this stuff. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. No, I wasn't really. I was like, no, 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 for the most part. Yes, a little bit. No, you know, you know what it is. And uh, then they, they gave me a super expensive insurance policy, which I had to have and I wasn't very happy about. Anyway, let's carry on. As Dino explains, when a funeral happens in our families, we all have a meeting to organize the burial, and we say, who have you included in your policy? What does your policy pay out? There's no secrecy in that. Wait, is this, is this serial killer killing people for their, like, funeral, funeral expenses? Really? Oh my god, I know, I don't want to sound out of touch, but it's not that much money. Is it really worth murdering someone over? But when Rosemary started adding several of her family members to her funeral policies, she kept it secret from everyone, and instead of contributing to their funerals, she pocketed the cash, leaving the family to shoulder the burden of the funeral costs on their own. Well, that is mega sketchy. You know what's more mega sketchy if it ends up that she's killing them? Also, is that... Is, really? I always say this. It's like, yo, if I was to take out an insurance policy... Or, or, on my wife, or my wife was to take it out on me. You gotta be like for the next few years, being like, don't die, don't die, don't die. Because if that, ha I mean, I'm like that anyway. But if that happens, they'll be like, you just took out a very expensive insurance policy on that person, and now they're dead, fact boy. Hmm. Right. This seems very obvious. How do you serial kill on this? Because surely the insurance policy, the insurance company is like, hello. <laughs> What's going on over here then? 
death comes to the village. New Forest is a small rural village 30 minutes north of Bushbuck Ridge, a large township in Mpalunga. The Nlovu family moved there in the late 1970s, and Joyce still lives there with her five children. Like many of the other residents in New Forest, Joyce and her children live in extreme poverty. They own a three-room house that the government had built for them in 2014 to replace the mud hut that they'd been living in before. It consists of a bedroom and a kitchen with a sitting area, as well as a tiny bathroom, and is sparsely furnished, with plastic crates being used in place of tables and chairs. Joyce wanted to become a teacher when she was younger, but never got the opportunity to study, and since work in the area is scarce, she had been unemployed for most of her adult life. Joyce mostly relies on social grants to support her five children, but she keeps a vegetable garden to supplement their diet, gathers firewood for heat and to prepare some of their meals, and does odd jobs around the village whenever she can. If it hadn't been for the events that took place on the 7th of March 2018, she would have lived a tragically unremarkable life. But at three o'clock that afternoon, Joyce was preparing to cook dinner with her five-month-old baby strapped to her back when she saw three cars stop outside the gate to her yard. Several men got out of the cars and were busy taking pictures of her house, so Joyce went outside to greet them and invite them in. <laughs> if people were outside my house taking pictures, I'd be like, what the fuck? What are you doing out there? Not, you want to come in for some tea? I'd be like, why are you taking photos of my house, you weirdos? Go away. When she was told that they were police officers, she asked them if she'd done anything wrong. They reassured her that she hadn't, and then another police officer entered her house, followed by her older sister, Rosemary. Uh-oh. If any time, like, police come to your door, or, like, the gas man or whatever, I'm always like, ID, please. Unless they're, like, got it pinned to their, like, the gas man often has it, like, pinned to his jacket. But there's times they haven't, and I've always been like, can I see some ID? It's just good practice. They asked me if I knew her. I said, I did. I started getting anxious, wondering what was going on or what had happened. They asked me if I knew what brought them to my house. I told them I didn't know anything, was surprised because I never wronged anyone. Oh, okay. I'm st Initially, I was thinking, wait, is this like some sort of elaborate thing to kill her? And I'm like, oh no, I see. They're, the police are there with Rosemary because they're, uh, they're like, Rosemary's done something, right? They're looking into it, and these are actually police officers. The detectives then told Joyce that she was supposed to die that night. Her sister Rosemary had hired hitmen to murder Joyce and her five children. She had wanted the hitmen to drug them, strangle them, and then burn their house down. Three years later, Joyce would stand up in court and tearfully relay the events of that afternoon, doing her part to ensure that her sister would spend the rest of her life in prison. Oh my lord! But if it hadn't been for a very dedicated police detective, it's more than possible that Joyce wouldn't be alive today to tell her side of the story. Oh, I love these ones. As soon as I saw those words, dedicated police detective, I'm like, yes, let's go. The ones I get so frustrated, casual criminalists, where it's just like, and then the police ignored all of the evidence. And then the police decided that this guy was guilty and did nothing else. And it's like, come on, police. And in this one, I'm like, yes, let's go. Dedicated police. I like it. It's very satisfying. The Sangoma's Daughter The Balu Bidu people live in Mojad Giesklouve in Limpopo, South Africa, and they are traditionally ruled over by the Majadi, also known as the Rain Queen. As was the practice in most of Europe and Asia, African kings would marry the daughters of their allies to strengthen the bonds between their tribes. When the Rain Queen established herself in southern Africa, she kept up the tradition by marrying the daughters of her allies instead of taking a husband. As a result, same-sex marriages have become common in the area since at least the 18th century. Whenever the Rain Queen needs an heir, the royal council selects a suitable man to father her children. Once they're grown, her sons will sit on the royal council, and her daughters are trained to take over the role of Rain queen i've always found the story of the rain queen to be quite fascinating but why is it relevant yeah it's very interesting because rosemary's birth was of a similar arrangement lucy mushawana rosemary's maternal aunt told local journalist nalidi shanga that back in the 1970s her brother noel had been complaining of chest pains for some time when he went to meet with a local singoma named maria mumbawini she told Noel that she had been bewitched, and if he wanted to be cured, he had to pay her 60 rand, which would be worth approximately 5,500 rand, or $290 today. Jesus Christ. I, need, I mean, I know it's like healing or whatever, but it's also not. And $290? That's an extraordinary amount of money. I mean, how much do you pay? I pay less to go to the doctor. But Noel told her that he wasn't able to afford it. Quote, The Sangoma agreed to treat my brother in exchange for our sister, Maria Sophie. 
Maria Sophie didn't mind. Our brother Noel got healed, and the two of them seemed to be living well for a while. Whoa, bro, did you just... Was your... Did you just sell your sister into a... Into a... Into a marriage? Bro. A while later, I'm... <laughs> you gotta be careful, because it's like, yeah, are other cultures I don't want to judge, but... Let's not do that, okay? <laughs> A while later, a local farmer named Wilson Ricozzo was approached to father their children, and he agreed. He fathered two daughters by Maria Sophie, and they were named Audrey and Rosemary. However, shortly after Rosemary's birth, the Sangoma started neglecting her wife. According to Lucy, I will never forget how one time I went to visit my sister there, and I found little Rosemary sitting on some thorns outside the house crying. It was bad. My sister was sick and had no food. She would often go to my brother and bother him for something to eat. When I saw the situation there, I took Rosemary to come and stay with me. The quote ends. Maria Sophie eventually left her wife and moved to New Forest, which is two and a half hours drive from Sarnin. I keep wanting to say The New Forest because there's a place in the UK called The New Forest. It's not just called New Forest, right? It is The New Forest. My parent, Weirdly enough, my parents just got back from a holiday in The New Forest. <laughs> The community of New Forest took her and her daughters in, and Maria would eventually marry a much older man named Sandras Nadlovu. Together, they would have five more children, including two more daughters and a son named Director. Okay, then. <laughs> What's your son's name? Director. And this is his brother, Manager, and his sister, Boss. According to Joyce, nothing about Rosemary's childhood indicated that she would one day turn into a killer. She was funny and caring, had an interest in poetry, and was considered by everyone to be a good, honest village girl. But they didn't have the easiest of childhoods. Joyce would later explain that as soon as we got home after school, we would change out of our uniforms and wash them. We would then have lunch. After eating, wow, school finishes early. <laughs> it's like school's over, going home for lunch. I used to fin we used to finish school. I used to get home from school at six o'clock. And I used to leave for school at ten to eight. School was really long. After eating, we would go and join our mother in the field. We had a huge family field, so there was no time to waste. We had to go and help our mother. End quote. In 1994, the 18 year old Rosemary met the 28 year old Hand Koza. At the time, he was working as a security guard for the local tribunal authority and earns a good salary. She fell pregnant and gave birth to a son, Jaunty, in March 1995. Shortly after, the couple got married, and when Jaunty was five years old, Rosemary told her husband, husband that she had been offered an opportunity to join the South African Police Service. Hand agreed, and Rosemary left her son to be raised by the Koja family. She signed up at the police college and trained to become a police officer, but according to the Koja family, moving to Johannesburg had changed her. Hand's brother Rogers explains that my brother would tell me that she would not want him to visit her in Guanting. She always had excuses not to see him, and that broke my brother's heart badly. He was my elder brother, but he would confide in me and complain and say that she was becoming someone else, someone he could not understand. Hand received a piece of his family's land and built a house on it for Rosemary, hoping that it would tempt her to move back to their village. But Rosemary was enjoying her life in the city, and she had no plans to return to the hardships of life in the village. Han fell ill in 2004 and was diagnosed with tuberculosis. He was admitted, Jesus, have we not got rid of that yet? It's 2004. Tuberculosis? That's like a disease of my grandparents. Like... He was admitted to the hospital, and the Koza family called Rosemary to let her know that her husband was in hospital and she was expected to come and visit him. To quote, Rosemary never bothered to come home and see him. It was painful for my brother. Imagine falling ill while you have a wife and she makes no effort to be close to you at all. It was painful, but there was nothing we could do. Two days before his death, Rosemary went to visit Hand in the hospital. After she left for Johannesburg again, his family grew worried when they didn't hear back from him and his sister Josephine went to visit him. The family had given Hand a radio to listen to and a cell phone in case he needed anything, but both of these items had been removed from his room. According to the hospital staff, his wife had taken them. He's on death's door, and she nicks his radio. Like, what the fuck? Hand passed away on the 18th of December 2004, and one of his brothers went to fetch Rosemary in Johannesburg so that she could attend her husband's funeral. Two days after he was buried, she went back to Johannesburg, even though there were several burial rituals that she was supposed to be a part of as the wife of the deceased and the chief mourner. Rosemary sold the house that Hand had built for her, putting claims against his life policy, and moved back to Johannesburg, leaving her nine-year-old son behind. Just with that other family? Oh my god, this is so strange. She seemed to be like, everyone thought she was normal, and now she's moved to the city and just abandoned her family. 
Why, what's up? By then, Rosemary had fallen in love with life in the city. She enjoyed dressing up, going out drinking with her friends, and spending most of her free time at Caesar's Palace, a casino and hotel that is now known as Emperor's Palace. She was earning a decent salary at the time, approximately 18,000 rand or $950, but Rosemary had become addicted to gambling and living the high life, and she was soon struggling to keep up financially. In an effort to bolster her finances, Rosemary got involved with the wrong crowd. She started borrowing from loan sharks, made friends with illegal firearms dealers, and started stealing weapons from police stations where she was stationed. Uh oh. According to Colonel Nathepa Bolakar, station commander at Tembisa South Police Station, quote, in 2014, when they opened Tembisa South at, as a station, she was transferred here to this station. Rosemary was not close to me, but I knew she was not trusted by the colleagues, especially with the firearms. There was an incident where she stole an R5 assault rifle. The R5 was nowhere to be found. One sergeant said, No, I saw you carrying a rifle. Where is it? She went where she hid it and came back with it. Then another incident. She stole a pistol. She was seen taking the pistol. That's why I'm saying they didn't trust her when it came to firearms. But an investigation was conducted. They couldn't prove who stole the firearm. It wasn't good for me, especially to my station. It wasn't good to the other police officers at this police station. End quote. Because of her behavior, Rosemary was never promoted further than a sergeant, and she was assigned to the Tembisa Police Station's branch of CIC, which stands for Community Intervention Center, which helps victims of trauma and abuse. According to Everson Luhanga, an investigative journalist with Scroller.Africa, quote, Many people uh, would come to her. She would comfort gender-based kind of violence victims and would welcome them, make them feel at ease, speak to them. According to Colonel Baloka, Rosemary was a nice person when we met. But as time went by, she started to book off sick, especially a month end. Rosemary wouldn't come to work. Every month end, there'd be people coming to my office to say, where is Rosemary? I said to them, I don't know where is Rosemary. I'm the station commander and I don't know where she is. It seems quite incredible that she's managed to hold on to her job because she's everyone thinks she's stealing stuff and she just kind of skives off work on the regular which uh like oh no she so she's just not gonna get promoted more it's like wait <laughs> if someone doesn't come to work don't they get fired it's like yo one thing about a job you gotta come to the job <laughs> otherwise you don't have a job anymore, do you? Then one morning in 2017, a group of more than 15 men showed up at the Tembisa South Police Station and demanded to speak to Rosemary. Initially, the police officers on duty held them off until Colonel Baloka allowed them to come inside and speak to him. They told him that they were all loan sharks and Rosemary owed them money. They told Colonel Baloka that if they got their hands on Rosemary, they were going to knock her around a bit until she paid what she owed them. Colonel Baloka promised to speak to Rosemary instead, and he and a representative from the Employee Health and Wellness Program would visit her shortly after to devise a plan for her to settle her debts. The crying Rosemary told Colonel Baloka that she owed the loan sharks an amount of 200,000 rand, which was equal to her annual salary. Oh my lord, if you owe someone your annual salary, you are so far in the hole. Unless that someone is a bank and it's a mortgage. Then you're okay. Right? <laughs> right? That's a different kind of debt. That's good debt, I tell myself. But she reassured her boss. She was expecting a big payout for her insurance company. When she received the money, she'd pay off the loan sharks, and they would no longer be a problem to anybody. The Disappearance of Witness Homu Rosemary's first known victim was her cousin, the 37-year-old Witness Madala Homu. Oh, when I read the title for this, I was like, ah, oh, she's a witness. Nope, she's a victim. Her name is Witness. According to his family, he was a devout Christian and had helped his mother to raise his younger sister, Eva, ensuring that she lacked for nothing. As children, Rosemary and Witness had been close since they were the same age, but they kept in contact when he moved to Johannesburg to look for a better job opportunity. In January 2012, Rosemary called Witness's mother, Lucy Mashawana, and told her that she'd heard that Lucy had recently celebrated her birthday. Lucy was surprised to hear from Rosemary and confirmed her date of birth, unknowingly providing the information that Rosemary had been fishing for. Rosemary offered to send her aunt 200 rand so that she could buy herself a birthday cake, and then asked Lucy whether she had included Witness in her funeral funeral policy. When Lucy asked her why she wanted to know, Rosemary told Lucy that your son is traveling a lot at night, and this is Joburg. He can be killed any time. Despite only earning a meager 600 rand or $31 a month. In when? 2012? 
Wow, okay. Lucy added Witness to her policy, then called her son and asked him if it was true that he was in danger. Witness laughed it off and told his mother that Rosemary was being paranoid, but Rosemary would call Lucy numerous times over the next two months, ensuring that her aunt was keeping up with the payments for Witness's funeral cover. On March the 30th, 2012, Witness's sister, Eva, was able to, unable to reach him. She'd later tell journalist Nalidi Shanga that, quote, We were meant to have met at Boulder's Mall in Midrand that Saturday because he had promised to buy me clothes. I needed clothes so I could go job hunting. I was working as a nanny at that time, and I hoped that I could get another job in retail, but on the day we were supposed to meet, his phone was off." End quote. Her cousin Godfrey called her on the 31st of March and asked her if she'd heard from Witness. When she said she hadn't, Godfrey explained that Rosemary had called him and told him that Witness's landlord was looking for him because he hadn't paid his rent that month. Rosemary called Godfrey back the next day and insisted that they had to go look for Witness. Godfrey wanted to go and see if Witness had returned home yet, but instead Rosemary took him to Ola Fansfontein police station and told the officers on duty that she'd heard they'd found a body that morning and that they were there to identify him. Oh my lord, can you imagine? It's like, yeah, you know, we're going to go look for him. And it's like, actually, we're going to the police station to ID your body. Sorry, I didn't mention that. You psycho. According to Eva, Rosemary then sent a message to let her know that they'd found witness, but later that day, a friend of hers, David, called her to convey his sympathies. He said to me they'd found witness at the mortuary. I was relieved that he was found, but in my absent-mindedness, it didn't occur to me that he was dead. I asked him, is Witness now working at the mortuary? He was healthy. He was a churchgoer. I'd never seen him drinking or fighting, so I couldn't imagine him being killed either. I thought perhaps if he could die in any way, it'd be him being hit by a car or something accidental. His autopsy revealed that Witness had suffered a brutal death. His body was covered in cuts and bruises, and his head had been bashed in with a heavy stone that was found next to his body. His bloody body was left in an empty field, where passers-by found him the next day. This is so psycho, and also so obvious. It's like, who do you think it could be? Could it be that Rosemary woman who randomly called up out of the blue, asked whether he had an insurance policy for his funeral or life or whatever it was, and then kept calling all the time to make sure that you were keeping up with the payments? Could it be her? Maybe. <laughs> Super suspicious. When Eva went to sort out his belongings and arrange for a death certificate, Rosemary met up with her and handed her all the necessary documents that they'd need to claim from the mother's funeral policy. When the family met to arrange Witness's funeral, Lucy used the money she had received from her own funeral policy to pay for refreshments, food for the mourners, and a casket, but it wasn't necessarily enough to cover everything. Rosemary contributed just 200 rand or $10 to Witness's funeral. Eva would later explain after Witness's funeral that the family is split apart and unfortunately no one can fix it. I even dropped out of the studies I was pursuing because I had no way to pay my fees anymore and someone needed to take care of my mother financially. I have to endure a lot of suffering at the hands of men simply because my brother was not around to protect me and fight for me. And his mother Lucy would bitterly explain after her son's funeral that Rosemary hasn't set foot here ever since. The murder of Audrey Nulovu. Out of the seven Nulovu children, Rosemary seemed to be the most successful financially. She had a good job, great benefits, and was able to send money to and help take care of her mother, Maria Sophie. Her eldest sister, Audrey, wasn't as successful. She'd also gotten pregnant at a young age and also had a son named Brilliant Meshagago. Her boyfriend left the village at one point and moved to Johannesburg, finding a job at O.R. Thambo International Airport. Hoping that it meant they could have a better future together, Audrey packed up her life and she and Brilliant headed to Johannesburg to meet up with his father. Things between them didn't work out, however, and Audrey showed up at Marchegio's family doorstep and told them that she could no longer take care of the four-year-old Brilliant on her own. Audrey headed back to Johannesburg, and then she found a nice corporate job. Oh, okay, so wait, she goes there, it doesn't work out, she goes back, drops her kid off, and then goes back to the city. Okay. It enabled her to care for Brilliant and live a comfortable life, but then she lost her job. She had to give up the house that she had been living in and move into a single room in someone's backyard. She started selling Tupperware and relied on her unemployment benefits to get by, but she barely made enough money to send the Marshigos in order to help support Brilliant, who was now in high school. Because the whole family knew that Rosemary had a good job, Audrey would often contact her younger sister during the month and ask her if she could send her money. Her neighbors all knew that Audrey's sister was a police officer, but until the afternoon of the 25th of June 2013, they'd never even met her. It was a Tuesday, and Audrey was getting ready for church when Rosemary called and said that she'd like to see her. Audrey left to fetch Rosemary from the street corner where the local taxi had dropped her off, and on their way to her house, proudly introduced Rosemary to her neighbors, including a traditional healer named Mrs. Nagupa. 
Audrey told her neighbors that they were going to have sandwiches and tea, and the two left for her room. A few minutes later, Audrey returned, saying that she was quickly heading out to buy some more bread and that Rosemary was making tea. The sisters drank their tea, and not long after, Rosemary left and didn't bother to say goodbye to her sister's neighbors, impressing upon them the idea that she was rude and unfriendly. Audrey never showed up for church, and later that night, Mrs. Nagumpa saw Rosemary return. She didn't stay long, didn't pause to greet the old woman, and left again. The next day, Rosemary was back. This time, she walked over to where Mrs. Nagupo was cleaning her yard. Mrs. Nagupo would later tell the court that Rosemary asked me when I had spoken to Audrey. She said she was worried because she had been trying to call Audrey but couldn't reach her on her phone. I told her that the last time I'd seen Audrey was when she was with you. I told her maybe Audrey's phone was dead. Then Rosemary started crying, saying that she was worried for her sister, and asked Mrs. Nagupo to go with her to make sure that Audrey was okay. At first, the old woman refused, but when Rosemary wouldn't stop crying, she relented and walked with her towards Audrey's room. Then, Rosemary started wailing and falling to the ground in grief, which startled Mrs. Nagumpa since there was no reason for Rosemary to act this way. Rosemary pulled out her phone, called her mother, and cried, Mum, my sister Audrey is dead. <laughs> wait, there's a woman right there. She'd be like, wait, why do you think that? What's going on? Could you be more suspicious? <laughs> like, what? Mrs. Nagumba chastised Rosemary, asking how she could claim something so terrible before they'd even gone inside. Yeah, why not just... I'm assuming that she's murdered her and there's going to be a body. Why on earth wouldn't you wait to see the body before being, like, calling? There's someone standing right next to you. You're that dumb. Some of Audrey's other neighbors heard her crying and came to see what was happening, and then went on knocked on Audrey's door. When no one answered, someone peered in through a window and said that there was something on the bed under, hidden under a pile of blankets. After prodding the pile with a long stick and not getting any response, they called Audrey's landlord and asked him if they could break down the door so that they could check on her. He agreed, and they started cutting at the burglar bars. Rosemary called one of her friends, Sergeant Pindila Shilubana, to tell her that there was something wrong with her sister. Sergeant Shalubana and another con uh, colleague, Sergeant Wisane Mabala, rushed to the scene and found Rosemary sitting outside Audrey's room, still wailing and pretending to feel framed. The officers, the police officers, were on the scene when Audrey's neighbors finally managed to break into her room, and inside they found Audrey's body hidden underneath the blankets. She had been strangled, and despite being dead only for a few hours, her body had already started to decompose. According to Mrs. Nungumpa, quote, Rosemary came into the room. She seemed okay. She was no longer crying. Mrs. Nungumpa pointed out the two teacups to the police officers, knowing that Rosemary had been drinking tea with Audrey the previous night, and told the two officers to inspect the cups. Before they could, though, Rosemary took the cups and walked out of the room, and despite Sergeant Shilubane's protests, she rinsed them out in a bucket of water, claiming that she was doing it out of respect for her sister so that strangers didn't come to her house and find it to be a mess. Yeah, um, that's a crime scene. The sergeant, we, the sergeant would be like, do not touch anything. Seal it off. Like, what are you doing? But she didn't touch any of the other dirty dishes. Could you be more suspicious, Rosemary? During the autopsy in Audrey's body, the pathologist noted that Audrey had first been poisoned and then strangled. Whatever poison she had ingested had hastened the decomposition process and made it impossible to determine a time of death or identify whatever poison had been used. Mrs. Nagumpa wasn't asked to make a statement, none of the other neighbors were interviewed, and it would be years before a police officer would show up at her door and ask her if she remembered a lady by the name of Audrey Nudlovu. The Death of Maurice Mabasa Rosemary met Maurice Mabasa at a roadblock. He worked as a chauffeur for the U.S. Embassy in Pretoria, and the two exchanged numbers. Maurice later introduced her to his family, and according to his brother, Justice, they felt reassured knowing that she was a police officer. If any of them got into any sort of trouble, they figured they'd be able to call on her for help. But they soon learned that Rosemary wasn't the kind of person that you'd want at your side when you're in trouble. According to Maurice's sister, Luceth, quote, When you don't know her, Rose has a sense of humor. When you don't know her, Rose is sweet. But Rose is also full of rage. She used to carry a black David Jones handbag. It was a glossy kind of black. She always kept a gun in that handbag. Yeah, sounds like Rose is like a psycho. And we know she's a psycho because she's murdering people. Rosemary and Maurice were together for five years. According to Luceth, the two of them used to fight a lot over money, and Rosemary told Luceth that she planned to fall pregnant to encourage Maurice to stay with her. Good way to get someone to stay with you. <laughs> that's that's going to work out well. I said no because I was committed to our relationship. Well, I hope you're still committed because I'm pregnant. 
Rosemary underwent IVF treatments, and daughter Makhanani was born. Maurice was overjoyed, but it didn't blind him to Rosemary's faults, and rumors had already started circulating that Rosemary had been involved in the deaths of several of her family members. Oh my god. <laughs> Be like, yeah, no, she's got her faults. Many of her family members keep dying, and we think that she's got something to do with it. So, you know, it's not a perfect marriage. <laughs> she's just doing a little bit of murdering. According to Justice, Maury said to me, she cannot kill me like she did other people. This must have meant that he knew about some of the people killed by Rosemary. What the fuck is that? Oh, yeah. No, she's, she just kills other people. She wouldn't kill her husband. That would be crazy. According to his family, there were at least two attempts on Maurice's life. The first attempt took place after McCarnany fell ill and had to spend some time in hospital. Rosemary was staying with her, and that night she'd sent Maurice home to collect more diapers for her. Maurice realized that someone was following him when he neared his house, and he ran into a neighbor's brightly lit yard for help. They both watched as the man who'd been following him ran away. In September 2015, Maurice had the day off and was spending it at home with little McCarney and her nanny. He told Justice that he'd taken a sleeping McCarney to the bedroom and fell asleep next to her on the bed. When he woke up, McCarney was gone and the room was filled with smoke. When he rushed outside, their neighbors were helping to put out a fire that had started inside their house, and Rosemary and the nanny were standing outside. Oh my lord, did you go in there, take the kid, and then set fire to the place so your husband will burn to death while he's having a nap, while he's looking after your kid together? That is fucking psycho, Rosemary. What the fuck? You're straight psycho. Like, no question. Rosemary had returned home, packed a bag containing clothes and diapers for the baby, as well as a stack of documents including McCarnany's birth certificate, and left the house, leaving Maurice there. I don't understand how you're still walking free. You are do just... You go in there and it's like, well, yeah, I'm going to burn the house down, so I need all my important documents, don't I? And then you burn the house down? Could you look more suspicious? It's madness! She later claimed that there must have been an electrical fault, but once the fire was put out, Maurice and their landlord found four two-liter bottles filled with petrol underneath the bed. Bro. And the, and the suspicion was that if Maurice hadn't woken up, he would have been burnt to a crisp. Yet, Maurice didn't open a case of attempted murder against Rosemary, probably thinking that because Rosemary was a police officer, the case would have been swept under the rug. Bro, that is terrible. And also... You, the victims don't choose to open a case. Like, sometimes a victim can choose not to prosecute, but if the police want to like be like, oh, well, that person attempted murder. And it's like, no, I don't want to prosecute. Don't give it shit. You, it's, we're going to court. We don't need you as a witness. We've got the gasoline, the petrol bottles underneath the bed. What are you thinking? You're going to prison, surely. Maurice broke up with Rosemary shortly after and moved out of the house, determined to keep his distance from her. Quote, at the time of his death, he was no longer sleeping at the home he shared with Rosemary in Clayville. He told me that he was leaving her. He said, I no longer want to be part of this woman's life. She thinks she can kill me, but she cannot kill me. Wait, did we just say at the time of his death? Uh-oh. On the morning of the 15th of October 2015, a call was made to the oulafont Safontine police station, saying that a body had been dumped in an empty lot. The person that called in had noticed the body when he left for work that morning, since the body was just lying a short distance from his front gate. He told the police that a vehicle had been driving past his gate repeatedly the previous night and had finally come to a stop late at night, after which it drove off and didn't come back. Blood had pooled where the vehicle had stood, and the body was found just a few meters away. The victim had been brutally beaten and stabbed 76 times in the head, neck, chest, arms, and legs. His eyes were black and swollen, some of his teeth were missing, and the only items that were found on his person were a tie, two bank cards, and 257 rand in cash. The scene was processed, all the relevant evidence was collected and tagged, and the items found with it were taken back to the Ulla Fontsefontein police station while the body was taken to the Germiston mortuary. That same morning, Rosemary walked into Ula Fontaine police station with the six-month-old Makanani strapped to her back. She told the officer on duty that her husband, Maurice Mabasa, had been missing for two days. The officer on duty started opening a missing persons docket, aka a case file for him, but Rosemary didn't have the necessary documents required to lodge a missing persons report, so she was told to go and collect the documents and then come back. When Rosemary left the station, she noticed the forensics van and saw one of the technicians carrying a sealed, opaque evidence bag with him containing items that were found on their murder victim. She turned around, stormed back into the police station, and started wailing, They killed my husband. 
The officers on duty tried to calm her down and asked how she knew that her husband was dead, but she didn't answer them. Instead, she started hitting herself and falling to the ground in a display of grief, prompting bystanders to remove her crying baby from her back in fear that she'd hurt her. At one point, Rosemary even fainted and collapsed onto the floor of the police station. This is all just a show, right? She's going to say, like, oh, they killed him because of my gambling debts. And it's like, really, you killed him for the money so you can pay off the gambling debts or whatever. Right? Allegedly? The officers on duty called Rosemary's brother-in-law, Justice Mabasa, to the police station, telling him to come to the Olafont Safontine police station immediately. When he arrived and asked what had happened, the police officers told him that a body had been found and Rosemary was claiming that it belonged to Maurice. They were both taken to the Germiston mortuary to identify the body, and Justice would later tell journalist Nalidi Shanga that, quote, I haven't seen anybody in that state before. Even if he had survived, I don't think we would have loved to see him with multiple scars like that. If it were me, I would not want to live after getting hurt so much. Oh my god, <laughs> that's depressing. It's like, yeah, okay, some people get badly beaten up, but it's like, I don't want to die just because I've got scars. Oh my lord. He had left a bruise on his left eye. When I was told how many holes were in his body, more than 80, some being repeatedly in the same spot, it was evident that the person had wanted to kill him. Yeah, when you put 80 holes in someone's body, that's, that's you know, that's, uh, what do they call it? Like, not evidence, but um, intent. Yeah, you intended to kill them. Justice was shown the clothes that the murder victim had been wearing at the time of his death, and after studying the clothes and looking at photos of the bank cards that had been found on the body, Justice was able to identify the body as belonging to his brother, Maurice Mabasa. Afterwards, Rosemary was taken to a trauma center to be treated for shock, and Justice took the six-month-old Makanani to his sister, Lusa, who would care for her until Maurice's funeral took place. Eventually, the Mabasa family would take Makanani back to their home village of Malo Malele in Nipobo, where they would raise her for the next year. The Accidental Death of Zanele Motha Technically, Rosemary and Zanela weren't related. Zanela's father was Rosemary's stepbrother. Zanela's father was Rosemary's stepbrother. Okay. <laughs> It's like, whenever you say that, it's like, yeah, my brother's sister's cousin's aunt. And you're like, oh, your brother's sister. Okay, gotcha. But Zanila had considered Rosemary to be her aunt. Not that they were particularly close or anything. In fact, up to 2015, the two of them never had much contact, and it was Zanela who approached her aunt first. According to her partner of nine years, Jaku. Jabu. According to her partner of nine years, Jabu, Zanela had inherited a house when her father had passed away, but Rosemary's brother, director, was now living in it. Jabu told Nalidi Shaga that, quote, Now that our family has grown and we needed our own place, Zanela had started communicating with her aunts with the hopes that she could assist in getting the house back. In 2016, 27-year-old Zanela enrolled as a college at Echkurulechni West College, hoping to further education so that she could earn a better income. She applied for a study loan and then approached Rosemary and asked her if she'd be willing to co-sign the loan for her. According to Jabu, quote, I remember Zanili saying that she has to go meet with Rosemary. She then had another meeting with her to sign off on that study loan. So on the day that she came back, she said they went for medical exams because she needed a medical certificate for her health. Zanili told me Rosemary had opened an insurance policy for her. She said Rosemary had told her not to tell me about this insurance policy, but we shared everything, so obviously she told me. I told her it didn't sit well with me. I couldn't understand why Rosemary had done this. Jabu and Zanela argued around this time, and Zanela left to visit Rosemary for a while, explaining to Jabu that she wanted to get to know Rosemary better. Jabu and Zelena kept in contact and called each other often, but one evening she stopped responding to his messages. Jabu was later told Zanela had been run over by a car. Witnesses had called an ambulance, and she was admitted to the Tembesa Hospital on the 13th of June 2016. She had complained of pain and had cuts and bruises all over her body, but x-rays revealed that she hadn't suffered any broken bones or internal injuries. Zanela was released from hospital the next day, and Rosemary and her brother, director, went to pick her up. The doctors gave Zanela her hospital file and told her to report to the pharmacy. There she was supposed to collect a prescription for painkillers and then hand her file back in. She never did. According to Jabu, quote, What disturbed me uh, was that after she was discharged from the hospital, I tried calling her, but Rosemary answered her cell phone. Rosemary told me that she was at work and had left Zanela at home. I was confused about why she would take Zanela's phone, knowing she was injured, and leave her without a phone, end quote. 
On the morning of the 16th of June, two days after Zanela was discharged from the Tembisa Hospital, Rosemary took her to Arwip Hospital, which is located in Kempton Park, half an hour's drive south of Tembisa. Within minutes of her arrival, however, the doctors declared Zanela had passed away. Post-mortem would reveal that she had been brutally assaulted. She had suffered multiple brain fractures and her liver had been severely damaged. Rosemary would later explain in court that Zanela had complained of chest pains shortly after she was released from the hospital, and on the morning of the 16th of June, she'd be lying on the floor, crying and begging her aunt to take her to the hospital. But Dr. Ipan Lengnaku, the doctor who treated her at Tembisa Hospital, would later tell the court that the injuries that Zelena had, uh, had sustained had been inflicted on her after she'd been discharged on the 14th of June. According to Jabu, quote, We never got an explanation of what happened, and it always bothered me. At the mortuary, oh, when we went to see Zanela's body, we could not really do so because Rosemary was there. We saw her through the glass at the mortuary, and afterwards, Rosemary took all the forms and documents. Life became difficult without Zanela. It was a struggle because everything in the house reminded me of her, especially with the kids. I have to comfort the older one a lot. She has good memories of Zanela, so she'd often cry and say that she misses her mother. The Assassination of Willie Mashaba Shortly after Zanela's funeral, rumors began to spread among Rosemary's extended family that there was a possibility that she'd had Zanela killed. Really? I wonder what makes you think that. It's like there's so... <laughs> Your crimes are so obvious. And there's a financial incentive as well. They might have been poor, but they weren't stupid. And they weren't buying Rosemary's version of events. So it was particularly alarming to the family that Zanela's older brother, the 40-year-old Willie, had kept in contact with his step-aunt after Zanela's funeral. Willie's body was found next to a busy road in Pretoria East on the 10th of April 2017. He had suffered multiple gunshot wounds to the head and his cell phone and money were still in his pocket. Constable Prince Matt Shakiri was one of the first police officers on the scene and he followed police procedure by unlocking the phone and calling the last number that the victim had dialed. The person on the other end identified herself as Rosemary Nalovu, and Constable Matt Shakiri explained to her that they'd found a body. According to his testimony in court, when he told Rosemary where to find them, she said she was familiar with the area and would be there soon. She arrived on the scene within 30 minutes. <laughs> His uncle calls you over and like, yeah, we found these bodies here. He's like, yeah, I know that place. I've been going there all the time. Be like, you should be like, what place? Give me directions. <laughs> Maybe give me a lawyer. No one saw her arrive in a taxi or her own vehicle. She simply walked onto the scene, ready to identify the body of her nephew. Later, the state's prosecutor, advocate Rihanna Williams, would argue that Rosemary had kept close to the scene in case they called her since the area where Willie was found was a good half an hour to an hour's drive away from her home in Tembisa. When the police started investigating his death, they tracked down two of Willie's friends who had been with him the night that he was killed. They were Mishak Nalovu and Bafana Halumuka, and they told the investigators that they'd been at a tavern just hanging out when Willie received a call from his aunt. He answered the phone but put it on loudspeaker to overhear their conversation. Rosemary asked Willie where he was and then told him to step outside so that they could talk. Willie came back and told his friends that his aunt Rosemary had asked him to meet up with her at a popular hangout nearby, but that they had to go alone. He left, and they never saw him again. The Torture of Brilliant Mashego Brilliant Mashego was just 24 years old when he was murdered, just a few weeks after the birth of his firstborn son. Brilliant's mother might have been a Nolovo, but she had been raised by the Mashegos and was a beloved member of their family. After his mother Audrey's funeral, the Nolovos had made him several promises, including telling him that if he wanted to go and study after school, he could, since his mother had provided for his education. He also acted on a desire to get to know his maternal family and was in constant contact with several of them. Quote, After Matrig, when he expressed his wish to go study, his aunt Rosemary said that he shouldn't worry, that she would look for a job for him in Johannesburg instead. Brilliant had heard rumors that Rosemary had received a large amount of money after his mother had passed away. It did have been speculated that he was in contact with her to find out what had happened to that money, possibly believing, as Audrey's only child, that he was entitled to some of it, especially now that he had a son to care for. In the months before he died, Rosemary would call Brilliant several times. According to his grandmother, Shurash Mashego, he'd stepped out of the house whenever Rosemary called him so that he couldn't overhear their conversations. One morning, she called him just before 4am and asked him to come outside and meet her. Brilliant would later tell his grandmother that there had been several men with her, and Rosemary had claimed that they were simply on their way to church. <laughs> at four in the morning. <laughs> Emma writes, nothing suspicious about that. 
<laughs> not at all. Not at all. He's definitely not going to get murdered. He's going to get murdered. According to Mrs. Meshago, Brilliance had even applied for his driver's license on Rosemary's say-so because she'd promised to find him a job at O.R. Fambo International Airport, the same place where his father had worked. She bitterly explained that, quote, "...that woman and her family had never done anything for him, did not even buy him a vest, but he seemed to be confident in her promises that she would help him find a better life." On the morning of the 22nd of January 2018, Brilliant told his grandmother that he was going to meet up with Rosemary in Nailsborough because she had some documents for him to sign. When he still hadn't returned that evening, they called his maternal grandmother, Maria Sophie, and asked if she'd seen him. She said that she hadn't. Then Brilliant sent several text messages to his cousin's phone, informing the family that he'd left to find a job in Kumatiport, a small town less than two hours east of their home in Bushbuck Ridge. Yeah. The text messages sent afterwards. It's, um, this is what, we've seen this many times on Casual Criminalist. It's what, like, an amateur criminal does to make it seem like the person's still alive. It's like, yes, run away with the circus. Everything's fine. If, <laughs> if I ever sent a message saying, yeah, just, just left for the circus to my family, I'd like to think they'd be like, uh, seems a bit, a bit out of character. They did just run off with the circus. Maybe he's been murdered. That was when his grandmother knew something was wrong. On the afternoon of the 24th of January, there was a knock at her door. Quote, when the police came here and told me to sit down, I immediately knew that the Lovos had killed my child. I'm bothered by his death. I wonder whether he cried, begged his aunt to spare his life, and how many other people were there when he was killed. Where are they now? The Lovos didn't make any contributions to the funeral. They didn't even come to see his body. I wanted them to see how ruined he was. Instead, when I called his grandmother and asked her what we could put together for his funeral, she asked me not to involve her in things that had nothing to do with her family. A House of Cards. Now, here at the Casual Criminalist, we're no strangers to police incompetence. I'm guessing that by this point, Simon has pointed out on numerous occasions that Romery was so fucking obviously the killer. Yes, Emma! Many times! The woman had obviously no shame and didn't even attempt to hide the fact that she'd somehow been involved in the deaths of several of her family members. Even her husband was like, yeah, no, she's killed people. She has. Everyone knows it. Come on, it's Rosemary. We call her Rosemary the Murderer. <laughs> But in the days and weeks following Brilliant's murder, Rosemary would find herself under immense pressure, and she was becoming desperate. You see, Rosemary knew that someone was on her tail. And I just cut out a huge section from the beginning of the script so that I wouldn't spoil the reveal. Okay. His name is Sergeant Keshi Beneth Mabunda, and he deserves the title of Certified Legend. Okay. So bestowed. According to an interview he did with the local radio station 94.7, Sergeant Mabunda had quite an orthodox career path. 19 years ago, he became a police officer because it was just another job, but he quickly realized that it enabled him to do a lot of good in his community, and he became passionate about finding justice for victims of his crime. Unlike another certain police officer we know, he was like, "Oh, I'm a cop now. You know what I can do? Steal guns and sell them to criminals. Oh dear, some people are just pieces of shit, aren't they? And what I do, I'll also kill my family for their, in for their, for their funeral money. You piece of shit, Rosemary. Do they have death penalty in South Africa? It'd be kind of nice, because these people have been killed and tortured by you for a small amount of money. Like, what the f***? I don't think they have death penalty in South Africa, though. I really don't. I don't know why I know that, but I don't think they do. Barely a year out of police college, he was handpicked to become a detective and was mentored by a much older and more experienced detective who taught him that the tiniest piece of evidence can make or break your case. He was taught to question everything, and when he overheard an unusual conversation at work one day, his interest was piqued. So let's take it back a step. It's now October 2015, and the body of Maurice Mabasa, Rosemary's boyfriend, had been discovered the previous day. That morning, Rosemary went back to the Ula Fontaine police station and went to see the investigating officer in charge of investigating Maurice's murder, Officer Paulson, not his real name. Paulson's office was located right next to Mabunda's, and Mabunda noticed that Rosemary was carrying a stack of papers with her. Mabunda listened as the two police officers casually discussed Maurice's murder and Rosemary's need to submit the insurance claims as soon as possible, and alarm bells went off in his head. Mabunda would later tell the radio station, 94.7, that, quote, So I left his office. I said, Chief, what are you signing? Then he said, no, it's just policies. So I said, no, call her back on your office, make copies of those documents and file them in the docket. He called her back, she came to his office, he filed everything and I went to inform him, today I'm taking over this case. Wait, what? I'm sorry, I'm a little bit lost. 
Ah, okay. So he's mega suspicious. He's like, what's up with those insurance policies? So he's onto it from like early on, which is nice. Like we were when it's like, um, wait, she took out policies and now she's getting them filled like immediately after his death. Suspicious. Sergeant Wunder paged through the various documents and saw that 16 funeral policies had been taken out on behalf of Murray, Maurice Mabasa. Oh my God. Could you? It, it's insane. Like, I made that joke earlier about if you take out a life insurance policy on them, you better hope they don't die anytime in the near future, or it's going to look mad suspicious, especially if they die of something suspicious. And it's like, you know what's worse? When you've taken out 16 policies on them. On each and every policy, Rosemary was listed as the only beneficiary and stood to receive an amount of 416,000 Rand, or about $22,000 if Marie suffered an unnatural death, more than double her annual salary. Mabunda then called the insurance companies to do a check on Rosemary's ID and found out that she had already claimed from several insurance companies on two separate occasions, first in 2012 and then in 2013. How is this not raising red flags in some sort of computer system? It's 2013! We had computers back then! It was only 10 years ago! Following the death of her cousin, witness, she had received an amount of 101,000 rand, or about $5,300. After her sister had been murdered, Rosemary pocketed an amount of 700,000 rand, or about $37,000. And when I checked those cases, the ways people were dying were mysterious ones. You can't believe a person is fine today, tomorrow he's dead. How is this not being discovered? This is an extraordinary amount of money. We're talking what? She's making 10 grand a year, American, and she's then made two years salary, six months salary, four years salary? What's going on? In each instance, the policy had been taken out and just six months later, the insured person has passed away due to unnatural causes. Mabunda managed to track down the dockets related to the murder investigations of both his witness, Humu, Homu, and Audrey Nlovu, and found barely any work had been done to investigate their murders. Witnesses hadn't been interviewed, reports hadn't been filed properly, the case files had been gathering dust, and he essentially had to start investigating their deaths from scratch. Working on the theory that Rosemary had had a cousin and sister murdered, he obtained copies of the policies that she'd taken out in their names. She'd taken out five different policies in Witnesses' name, two of which had paid out and had listed him as her spouse because she was very much aware that the payout from one of the policies would double if her spouse had passed away. Oh my god. This is just so... I, I keep saying this, but it's so blatant. Mamunda also discovered that when she'd taken out the policies on Audrey, Rosemary had impersonated her sister during the call, and Mabunda added fraud charges to the already growing list of offences. Now that Rosemary was a suspect in multiple murder investigations, Mabunda applied for access to her bank accounts and cell phone records and discovered that Rosemary was still paying for at least 28 funeral policies, which meant that there was a possibility that more people would die before he had enough evidence to arrest her. For the next three years, Abunda quietly worked behind the scenes to ensure that Rosemary wouldn't discover that he was onto her. The two of them weren't based at the same police station, but he did his very best to avoid her as much as possible and assigned all of the case files to a fictitious name so that she wouldn't discover that, she, that he had taken over the investigations. Yes, I can see why this guy got his legend certification, because this is some good shit. God damn it, do I respect you. And when Zanela died just eight months after Maurice had been murdered, Mabunda took over a murder investigation as well. He called the insurance companies that Rosemary had bought policies with and had Rosemary flagged as a fraudster, but not before she had received an amount of about 120,000 Rand or about $6,300 from the life insurance policy see that she'd taken out if Zanili died an accidental death. In total, Rosemary had received just over 1.39 million Rand for murdering her family members. The puzzle pieces were already falling neatly into place when Mabunda heard of the death of Willie Mashaba. Because they already had access to Rosemary's cell phone records, they could prove that she'd been with Willie at the time of his murder and hung around in the area until the police called her the next day. When Brilliant died nine months later, Rosemary's cell phone records showed that she'd met up with Brilliant in Nailsprit, travelled with him to Johannesburg that same night, and then back to Bush Buckridge early the next morning before dumping his body there. At the time of his murder, Rosemary's cell phone was in the exact same location as Brilliance, a silent witness to the events that took place that night. <laughs> ah! Again, again, this is so sloppy. I can't believe you got away with so many crimes. The noose was slowly tightening. Slowly is the operative word here, Emma. So slowly. Uh, and it wouldn't be long before her actions caught up with her. But two more deaths had taken place, and they were proof of just how far Rosemary would go to satisfy her greed. 
the death of Jaunty and Little Makanani. In the documentary Rosemary's Hit List, Mabunda explains that he hadn't been able to prove that Rosemary had murdered her children, but the facts suggest that she might have had a hand in hastening their deaths. After the death of her first husband, Hand Koza, Rosemary didn't bother to go and visit Jaunty, but in 2008, she called Hand's youngest, younger brother, Rogers, and asked him whether Jaunty could come and visit her in Johannesburg during the winter school holidays, which are from mid-June until mid-July. Quote, schools were still closed at the time, and she would bring him back when the schools reopened. I said it was okay. I didn't mind it. Then she suggested taking Jaunty to a multiracial school. She told me that she would need me to sign some forms, so we agreed on that. Shortly after Jaunty arrived in Johannesburg, the family was told that the 13-year-old Jaunty had ingested an unidentified slow poison and had ended up in hospital. Once he recovered, Rosemary went to fetch him and took him back to her house. He passed away a day later, on the 14th of July 2008, and as his only beneficiary, Rosemary received an amount of 12,000 rand that had been put into a trust for him in accordance with Han's will. After Maurice's murder, his mother, Mary Mabasa, took Maka Nani in after Rosemary complained that her baby wouldn't stop crying. Oh my lord, it's like Rosemary the murderer, and she's complaining about someone. <laughs> Save them, for God's sake. Quote, when Rosemary would come to visit, Makanani would peek around the corner at her. Rosemary said Makanani was looking at her like a stranger. I told her that she couldn't possibly forget her own mother, but she had grown very fond of us. But Rosemary wasn't satisfied. And shortly before Makani's second birthday, Rosemary came to collect her daughter and take her back to Tamisa with her. It's not clear what happened to the little girl. In April 2017, just days before Willie was murdered, Rosemary had taken Makanani to a hospital. According to the nurses who admitted them, Makanani wasn't breathing when her mother carried her into the emergency room and there was nothing that the doctors could do for her. According to Justice, he had insisted that a trust fund had to be created for Makanani after her father was murdered. When Makanani died, Rosemary inherited all of the money that had been intended for her daughter. Quote, I was the one who had suggested that the trust fund be opened. I feel I shouldn't have suggested the trust. I should have told Rosemary to take everything because maybe the child's life would have been saved. Maybe she would not have died. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe Rosemary would be like, oh, she doesn't have any money, so let's just take out 17 death policies on her and then cause her death. Because it's not your fault. Rosemary's a psycho. Change of heart. Towards the middle of 2017, Rosemary was becoming more and more desperate. None of the insurance companies she'd claimed from after Willie's murder were processing her claims. <laughs> what a surprise! Then she had brilliant murdered in January 2018, and again the insurance companies refused to pay out, claiming that there were too many inconsistencies in her documentation. The loan sharks had been circling, oh yeah, she owes all this money, I forgot about that, had been circling her for more than a year at this point. Her informants were telling her that Mabunda was onto her and Rosemary was feeling the pressure. A man named Lakiwa Mkeza would later testify that Rosemary had approached him in 2017 and asked him to murder her mother, Maria Sophie. She had paid Mkiza 2,900 rand as a deposit and promised to give him another 15,000 rand if the hit was successful. Mkiza agreed and Rosemary travelled to Bushbuck Ridge where Rosemary pointed out her mother's house. Then Rosemary got into a minibus taxi and went back to Johannesburg. <laughs> Wait, this guy later came forward and was like, yeah, 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 she wanted me to kill her mum. And I said I'd do it. <laughs> the police are going to be looking into you, mate. And Keza later explains how he'd been supposed to murder the old woman that night, but instead he approached her during the day. She was sitting outside her house with one of her granddaughters when Keza caught her watchful eye. He decided not to murder her. Instead, he politely greeted the old woman, asked her for a glass of water and left, returning to Johannesburg later that day. Rosemary also met with another man called Najabolo Kunena and ordered a hit on her younger sister Joyce and her five children. Rosemary explained that she didn't have the money to pay Kunene at that moment, but she'd pay him once she received the payout from the insurance policies that she'd taken out in Joyce's name. Rosemary also threatened his sister's business and told Kunene that if he did as she asked, she'd ensure that his sister received a portion of the money. But what horrified Kunene about the order was that Joyce had just given birth to her fifth child, and here Rosemary was ordering him to strangle the newborn baby and set its body on fire. Yes, like assassins are assassins like we're not like oh yeah no they're redeemable they're assassins they kill people for money but and a, there's a different there's a difference right there's the assassin who kills bad people on probably the like good assassin side of the scale and then there's the assassin that murders a woman and her five children which is like the biggest pieces of, shit of humanity 
During a murder trial, both of these men insisted that they were simply small-time criminals and not killers. So when they were faced with pure evil, the two would-be hitmen walked into the Tembisha South Police Station and reported Rosemary's actions to her station commander, Colonel Baloka. According to an article by Everson Luhanga, the informant said Rosemary had first asked him to kill her mother. Then she had asked him to kill her sister and nephews and nieces, Imapalanga. The hitman felt sorry for Rosemary's family, and so he didn't carry out her requests. Colonel Baloka immediately contacted the Hawks, South Africa's version of the FBI. That's a sick name, by the way. <laughs> Their FBI. We have like Scotland Yard. Is that like British FBI? I'm not sure. It's a different system. But like Scotland Yard, I always imagine we'd like big police. But like South Africa have Hawks. Sick. And together with the two hitmen, they planned a sting operation. Colonel Baloka was put in contact with Sergeant Mabunda, and Mabunda caught him up on his investigation into the deaths of various members of Rosemary's family. And as the two investigators merged, Sergeant Mabunda and the Anti-Corruption and Crime Intelligence Unit of the Hawks realized that they now had everything they needed to prove that Rosemary was a killer. So they set a trap for her, and in her desperation, Rosemary walked right into it. I feel like, do they really need a trap? The amount of evidence is overwhelming boys catching a killer the plan was simple Mkeza and Kunena, the two hitmen, got back into contact with Rosemary and told her that they knew someone who was willing to carry out the hit. His name was Rasta, like Rastafarian. <laughs> oh, that's a pronunciation guide, my bad. <laughs> like Rastafarian, an experienced hitman from KwaZulu Natal. And if you hadn't guessed it already, he was also an undercover police officer. Rosemary told her new hitman that she'd meet up with him on the morning of the 7th of March 2018. The day before, Rosemary booked herself into the psychiatric ward of the Life Kastenhof Hospital in Midrand to be treated for work-related stress and notified her family that she was going to spend a week there. She got a day pass from the hospital for the next day and had to be back by 5 p.m. on the afternoon of the 7th of March. Rosemary then called her sister, Joyce, and told her that she was coming to see her, ensuring that Joyce would be home the next day. On the morning of the 7th of March, the two would-be hitmen and their new friend Rasta showed up at the Kastanov Hospital at 7am where Rosemary was waiting on them. As they drove the four hours to Bushbuck Ridge, two more vehicles containing several police officers followed them. Rosemary sat in the passenger seat of the car and told Rasta exactly how she wanted him to murder Joyce and her children, and their entire conversation was recorded via hidden cameras placed inside the car. <laughs> uh, how can you fall for this? I know you're an idiot, and it's like, but... <laughs> It's like, wow, your incompetence is extraordinary. How did you get away with this for so long? Rosemary proposed several scenarios, one of which involved giving Joyce and her children flu medication to drink so that they would be fast asleep when Rasta entered their home. He then had to strangle Joyce and her children, ensuring that no witnesses were left behind before he set the house on fire. Quote, but please don't use guns and knives. Using those things will result in the money not being paid out. That is a village. Those kinds of deaths aren't common. When a house burns, it can even be an ex-boyfriend who sets it alight. A fire can be caused by anything, even an electrical fault. Not much attention is given to fire cases, but when it comes to guns and knives, those deaths they investigate. So when a house burns down, everyone burns with it. They stopped along the way, and Rosemary was caught on camera filling up a two-liter bottle with petrol that Rasta would then use to burn Joyce's house down. When they reached Bushbuck Ridge, Rosemary directed them toward her sister's house and then ordered them to take her back to the taxi rank so that she could catch a taxi back to Johannesburg. That way, she would be spending the night in hospital while Joyce and her family burned. Quote, Once I get the news, I will get discharged, rush back home, and start preparing for the funeral, and then I claim. What makes you think they're going to allow you to claim? They've already been refusing all of your claims because you're suspicious and the dude marked you as a fraudster. As soon as Rosemary sat down in the minibus taxi, it was surrounded by police officers. They charged her with six counts of murder, eight counts of conspiracy to commit murder, four counts of fraud, three counts of defeating the ends of justice, and the attempted murder of her mother before taking Rosemary back to Joyce's house. According to Joyce, quote, I was shocked when the police arrived here and told me that by that evening, 9 p.m., my children and I went to have been killed so she could claim insurance policies. Rosemary stood here and she didn't say a word to me. She didn't deny it. She didn't say a thing. Yeah, because Rosemary's a psycho. According to Sergeant Mabunda, Rosemary had taken out seven funeral policies in Joyce's name, but none for her children. If they'd died that day, Rosemary would only have received 25,000 rand for taking Joyce's life. Her children were simply collateral. Rosemary the Celebrity The day after arrest, 
Sergeant Mabunda visited Rosemary in the cells at Tambisa South Police Station and read the charges to her. He started questioning her about the murders, but she was arrogant and rude and denied everything. And Mabunda outright told her, with your attitude, you'll never get bail. Oh, you're never getting bail anyway. Also, how can you deny it? You were just filmed for hours sitting in a car talking about how that hitman, who's a police officer, should murder your family. Like, what? What? You, wait, wait. <laughs> get a lawyer and get whatever deal you can. Because otherwise... I mean, you're going to prison forever. Like, there's no question about it, right? You might as well just admit it. Maybe she's like, oh, fuck it, I'll just deny it because I'm going to prison either way. I'm not getting bail. It's many, many murders that I'm here for. Shortly after, one of their informants called Mabunda and warned him that Rosemary had put out a hit on both him and Colonel Baloka, and it was discovered that Rosemary's friends and informants were smuggling cell phones into the prison for her. She was moved to the Kosi Mampuru prison, a high-security C-Max prison, where she could be monitored 24-7, but up to this but up to the day she was sentenced, Mabunda and Colonel Bukloha lived with the fear that they and their families might be in danger. In the three years following her arrest, Rosemary applied for bail on multiple occasions, but Mabunda was there during every hearing telling the court that Rosemary was an extremely dangerous individual and that if she got out of prison, more people will die. And the Colonel is absolutely, uh, sorry, not the Colonel, the, the detective or whatever, Mabunda, is absolutely right. Why would you even have a bail hearing for someone who's got multiple murders? The fact that two more cases of conspiracy to commit murder had been lodged against her only strengthened his arguments, which I feel shouldn't need any strengthening. She's a terrible murderer. And Rose Rosemary was denied bail again and again and again. Rosemary's murder trial started on the 21st of January 2022, and from the get-go, it was clear that Rosemary was a character. According to journalist Nalidi Shanga, Rosemary started putting up a show for them almost from the moment she set foot in court. According to Linda Nisi, a reporter for Newsroom Africa, she told them that she'd known the media would be there, so she'd gotten up at 4am to get ready for her day in court. According to Nisi, quote, People come into court and they hide their faces for the smallest crime. People who were looting would come into court with their faces covered. But not Rosemary. She posed for photos, sarcastically telling the journalists that she only wanted to make their jobs easier, offered to turn so that they could get better views of her, and made jokes with the journalists who snapped photos and shook their heads at her arrogance. One of the first clips I saw of her, I was of her facing the cameras, dancing and proudly saying, Breaking news, breaking news, ex-police officer Nomi Rosemary Lodovo appeared at Palm Ridge Court. What what? Thug, thug, thug. Afterwards, she angrily explained to journalists that they're all liars, that they love to make up stories, and they'd even take photos of her private parts because they have no shame. But despite her obvious disdain of the media, Rosemary would continue this show throughout her trial and did her best to dress up as the trial progressed, having her hair and nails done and wearing elaborate makeup, making the photos of her seem like photo shoots instead of trial footage. Journalist Nalidi Shanga recounts in her book, Killer Clop, the Rosemary Lodovo story, but at the end of that first day in the dock, she turned like a flash of lightning. She seemed to have had enough of the paparazzi, and in an instant her darker side emerged. This was a serious, frowning, no-nonsense rosemary. It petrified me. She gestured at the photographers to stop taking her pictures. She pulled up her face mask and waved her finger, warning them to stop. She went as far as throwing toilet paper at one photographer, who kept snapping images of her. End quote. Rosemary kept on her display of anger uh, when she left the court and even threw a tin of Pringles at a journalist. For the rest of her trial, Rosemary was forced to wear shackles and she played up the drama even more, walking around like an old infirm woman who now needed others to support her. With the court in session, Rosemary's entire demeanor changed again. She quietly sat and listened and made notes as the state made their case, calling on 54 different witnesses to testify against her. These included Joyce, Rosemary's Aunt Lucy, Aubrey's neighbors. Zanela's boyfriend and mother, Justice Mabesa, police officers who worked with her, various forensic specialists, and the two hitmen that Rosemary had hired to murder her mother, Joyce, and her family. When it was her turn to testify, Rosemary denied everything and insisted that all the evidence against her was circumstantial and hearsay. They didn't find her DNA on the bodies, they didn't have her fingerprints, they didn't find any murder weapons that they could link to her, and a lawyer reasoned that the state couldn't prove that Rosemary had been the person to commit the crimes she was accused of. Rosemary's face was almost expressionless, and when she was shown photos of her victims, she tried to hide her smile when she was presented with her bank statements, phone records, and copies of her fraudulent claims, and the only time when she seemed to break on the stand was when Maurice's murder was discussed and she burst into tears. At the end of her trial, forensic criminologist Colonel Elmari Mayberg told the court that Rosemary was a dangerous individual and that she wasn't a suitable candidate for rehabilitation, explaining that, quote, the accused has never shown any remorse for her crimes. As a result, she has shown no empathy towards her victims or their families and does no remorse for her actions. 
On the 22nd of October, 2022, Judge Manama read his judgment of the case. During their closing arguments, the defense had once again argued that all the evidence against Rosemary was circumstantial and told the court that the state has not proved its case beyond reasonable doubt. Therefore, it is respectfully submitted that this honorable court should find the accused not guilty on all charges. Because of this, Judge Manama explained that because the evidence against Rosemary was circumstantial, both the state and the defense had based their case on the conclusions that could be drawn from the evidence that was presented to them. He further goes on to explain that for the circumstantial evidence to be accepted as fact, they have to agree with the theory as presented to the court. The facts were that all of the victims had died violent deaths. In most of the cases, she was the last person to be seen with her victims. She was the last person they'd contacted. Rosemary was the only beneficiary of the policy she'd taken out in their name, fully aware that if they died violent deaths, it would be of greater benefit to her. She ensured that their bodies would be discovered. She submitted claims against their policies within hours of their identities being confirmed. When it came to conspiring to murder her sister, she was captured on video issuing instructions on how they should be killed and on the same tape explaining that the hitman would also benefit from the murder since she intended to use the insurance money to pay them. Yeah, there's like, that's not circumstantial. That's basically a confession in video. Like, and there's also a point where it's like, there is so much circumstantial evidence that that's enough, right? Like, on the weight of things, it's beyond all reasonable doubt. Quote, On the basis of this analysis, I'm satisfied that the facts disclose the need for the admission of factual evidence, and they disclose that the accused is one of many people who, like Charles Dickens's Madame Defarge during the French Revolution, was always present at the guillotine knitting. The crimes are oh, brazen and calculative. She has threatened the investigating officers and also the employees of the insurance companies. The accused is cruel, hellish, bullish, brazen. The accused was manipulative and always deceitful, tricking her victims into believing that she loved them so that they always refer to her as their auntie. Once she seduced them into a sense of security, she struck like a vulture. End quote. Rosemary was found guilty on almost all of the charges against her and received six life sentences for the murders of her family members, five years for defe defeating the ends of justice by tampering with evidence, 30 years for three counts of fraud, 10 years for incitement to commit murder, as well as an additional 10 years for the attempted murder of her mother, tallying up to a total of 55 years. All of her sentences are to run concurrently. Wait, concurrently? That means at the same time? Not consecutively? Wait, so the most she got was a life sentence, right? Or 30 years for three counts of fraud. So that's pretty long. Um, or is that 30 years? So is that 10, 10, 10? Because if that's 10, 10, 10, then that's only 10 years if it's concurrent. So she's looking at, let's say she's looking at 30 years. Effective period of imprisonment, therefore, is life. Rosemary just watched the judge as her sentence was read out, her face covered by a mask. Once the formalities regarding her imprisonment were finalized, Rosemary pointed towards the people at the back of the courtroom and threatened them by saying, I will spend this Christmas in jail, but next year I will be out. I will be back, and you will see. No, you won't. You're going to prison forever. You're going to that C-Max or whatever it was called. You're never leaving. However, at the time of writing, Rosemary is still on trial for conspiring to murder Sergeant Mabunda and Colonel Baloka and has a heavy police contingent that follows her every movement outside of court. Wait. Follows heavy police continue, follows their movement outside of court. Why is she not in prison? Or is she in, Oh, okay, so outside of court and outside of prison? Surely she's just moving between prison and court. In an interview with Newsroom Africa, Mabunda reassured them for his safety and Colonel Beloga's families, Rosemary is going to spend the rest of her days at Kosi Mapumru prison, locked away under heavy guard like the monster she is. In his own words, as long as she's there, I'm safe. Yeah, and she's going to be there forever like that it's like a whole life whole life order or whatever dismembered appendices number one following rosemary's arrest the finance regulator started implementing new measures to detect fraud and murder for gain schemes when it comes to funeral policies in effort to prevent anyone from abusing the system in the same way that rosemary had it's insane to me that the system could be abused that way in the first place to be honest you gotta sort that shit out number two when she was arrested rosemary had nothing to show for all the money she pocketed it had gone to pay off her debt and feed her gambling addiction Number three, a month before Rosemary's arrest, a man named Justice Madaho walked into Tembisa police station and told them that his wife, Nomsa, and her friend, Rosemary Nalovu, had ordered a hit on his life so that they could pocket the insurance money. 
His wife was arrested alongside Rosemary. In another case, a conspiracy to commit murder was opened against her. Their trial started in April 2023 and is still ongoing. Number four, one of Rosemary's other sisters, Runny, had passed away from natural causes after Rosemary's arrest. Runny was also on her hit list, so Rosemary started the process of claiming the insurance companies from inside prison. Luckily, Mabunda was notified since it flagged her, and he was able to stop the claims from being processed. Holy, are you insane? I guess it's like, oh, get out of prison anyway, might as well try, get some commissary money, buy some noodles. One of Rosemary's cousins, another police officer named Gladys, was warned in 2008 that Rosemary had put a hit out on her, and she immediately went into hiding. Even after Rosemary was sent to prison, Gladys chose to remain in hiding for her safety. Number six. Several of the people we've discussed during this episode were also on Rosemary's hit list. Her aunt Lucy, her cousin Eva, her sisters Nonsanto and Runny, as well as her brother Director. And yet Director and other members of her family all proclaim her innocence and have shunned Joyce for standing up in court and doing her part to ensure that Rosemary will spend the rest of her life in prison. Are you kidding? She's your sister, but she is as guilty as sin, my dudes! Number seven. As part of his judgment, Judge Manama made a point of congratulating Mabunda on a job well done and reiterated the fact that if he hadn't followed up on Rosemary's suspicious behavior, all of those case files would still be gathering dust at police stations all over the country, and several more people would now be dead. Number 8. On the 28th of January 2023, Sergeant Mabunda received an award for Detective and Forensic Services Employee of the Year for his work on Rosemary's case and starred in the documentary Rosemary's Hit List. According to Mabunda, whenever people stop him on the street now to ask him if he's the Mabunda, he simply replies, No, I just have one of those faces. And that is where we end today's video. That was a long one and super interesting i can't believe how long she got away with those crimes for if you like this show please do leave it a review wherever you get or rating on spotify or whatever if you're watching on youtube like and subscribe and i'll see you next time <laughs>